expression, you know, I opened two gifts this morning, my eyes. You know, that's a blessing in itself. I don't care if it's raining outside or cold. You know, it's raining, the flowers will be happy. They, every day is a new day. Every day we get to open our eyes and see something. It is literally, it is a blessing. It's just art is such a part of my life and everything that I do in all of my companies, but vision is like art because it's priceless. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the 2020 podcast, bringing clarity to business, entrepreneurship, and life. I am your host, Dr. Harbir Sayan. Thank you for taking the time to join me here to learn and to grow. I am very, very excited for today's guest, joining us all the way from London, England. I wish I was there right now. Anybody who knows me knows I grew up there. Uh, but she spends a lot of time in various cities. We'll touch on that. But she is the co-creator of TFOS and the founder of Eyes Are The Story, a wellness meets beauty brand, uh, creating different products um, tailored around eye health. So I'm very excited to welcome and introduce Amy Gallant Sullivan. Amy, thank you so much for, for being on the show. Thank you, Harbier. It's so nice to be with you today. And thank you for accommodating the time zone. So. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. So uh, we'll get to the whole London and Europe thing in, in a few minutes. But one of the things that I loved about when I first uh, introduced myself to you, to, to you know, reach out to you to connect, uh, the, one of the first things you said back to me is, just so you know, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a doctor. And I was inside. I was like, perfect. Because anybody who knows me or listens to the podcast, I'm deliberately trying to get out of the, that bubble of just eye care professionals or health professionals and, and talk to people in business and entrepreneurship. So that was, that was a, actually a really great way to introduce yourself to me. But I was curious then, how do you introduce yourself to people in general? So like we often will describe ourselves by what we do, right? I would say I'm an optometrist and so on. How do you describe yourself? Well, it's actually kind of amusing. How's it going guys? I just want to take a quick minute of your time to introduce you to a new service, a new little bit of technology that's going to become invaluable to us as eye care providers in the very near future. As we know, online services like e-commerce and telehealth have blown up during COVID. Their accelerated pace has really changed the eye care game and it's time for us as eye care providers to make sure we are on top of these services so we're providing the best level of care for our patients and i'm very excited to introduce you to a company named lensbox which is going to combine all of these online services like e-commerce telehealth subscription models contact lens sales eye drop sales you name it all into one tidy little package for us to be able to communicate to our patients much more clearly so keep it locked to learn more about Lensbox. In the meantime, go to shoplensbox.com or just send me a message on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you like to learn more. I'll be coming to you with more information real soon. Until then, enjoy the rest of this episode. I'll talk to you soon. Because I spent uh, a good part of the first half of my life trying to escape from the medical field because my entire family is in the medical profession. So for me, I, I said, no, I won't have anything to do with it. But I was, I, I'm not going to say I was dragged and kicking and screaming, but it was just really funny because no matter how much I tried not to be a part of it, it's just part of my DNA. So I had to work with the doctors. I said, okay, fine, let's, let's do this. Um, so how do I introduce myself? Yeah. Uh, good question. Hi, I'm Amy. <laughs> uh, I guess you could say I'm... Um, well, it's interesting because I had a conversation the other day and maybe you could consider me a misfit. Uh, I don't really fit into a mold with anything. Um, and that's also kind of encouraged me to start the companies that I have because I did once try to work in the, the corporate space with the cubes and the carpets and those rules. But I always had so many different ideas. I didn't fit into a box. I always had a different vision and a different desire. And I was just so fast and furious. And so misfit entrepreneur. <laughs> misfit, oh, that's a, that's a cool title. I like that. Misfit entrepreneur slash ninja. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. That's my name. I mean, it's just kind of, and one of my friends the other day said, it's really interesting and intriguing because in fact we launched TFOS 
right after 9-11, like literally right mm-hmm. after 9-11. And then when there was the global economic downturn, I launched another a foundation actually um, for art preservation, mm-hmm. fundraising. Mm-hmm. When everybody else is you know, losing money, I launched a sponsorship program. And then during the pandemic, I just launched another company. So again, it kind of fits into the misfit category because yeah. I don't follow the the typical patterns or rules or cultural norm, I guess you could say. So I just, I like to create things. And when there's an unmet need, I just, I just like to make it happen. So. Yeah. Fantastic. I definitely that those three things that you just described that those specific times in history, uh, definitely just, I think going against the grain is a term that's coming to mind. Uh, that's pretty amazing that you have the, the, the guts, I guess, to, to pull that kind of stuff off during those periods. Um, and where, what, how would you describe your, your journey then into entrepreneurship? So you said your, your family, your background, there's a lot of medical kind of professionals or, or you know, you're surrounded by that and you're sort of dragged into that. But was it sort of a straight line, like I'm going to be an entrepreneur or was there something that happened or a few things that happened along the way that kind of made you want to go out and do your own thing? Well, the interesting thing is, especially with TFOS, um, when 9-11 happened, I was actually working for, say, a normal company and in the in the tech space. So I was working with tech startups and that whole industry just pretty much bottomed out at that time. And my father came to me and he said, would you be willing to help me create a company? And I said, Ooh, this sounds like fun because at that point I, I had to interview for a new job. And I said, I don't want to work in a cube. I can't do that again. I just, I did not fit into that box. Mm. So he said, well, while you're looking for a job, could you help me create this thing called the Tearful Monocular Surface Society, which he had incorporated um, a couple of years before mm. uh, the idea and he had ordered organized conferences and he said, but we need to do something. We need to build an organization, a society, and really engage the, the doctors and scientists and industry from around the world. And because of your business background and your languages, et cetera, et cetera, would you be willing to help? And again, this is literally right after 9-11. And I said, ooh, I can create something. And there isn't anyone that's going to tell me, no, you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. My only rule was if I failed, one, I would disappoint my father. And two, I would look like an idiot. (laughs) So I said, okay, don't fail. So that's kind of what really got me into the, say, the entrepreneurial track because I was so excited to be able to create something at that stage, really at the beginning of my career. And I had to, I literally had to prove not only to my family, but to the entire world that I could do it. And it didn't matter what my age was. It didn't matter that I was female. It didn't matter that, you know, it, 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 I said, prove yourself, prove it, just do it. So really from that point, I just said, okay, let's just build, let's just create, create, we have a vision, let's just make it happen. And I think that really, that ignited the call it passion for creating things and just kind of saying, okay, let's go for it. You know, you say it, you put it out there. You just, you just do it. So there aren't, there aren't obstacles. That's fantastic. Or you just move them. (laughs) Or you just move them. Yeah. That's, if you can make it happen, you make it happen. That that's really cool. Actually that sounds, it resonates definitely with me, but I didn't really think of it that way as, as an entrepreneur, you're sort of a a creator almost in, in the terms of like, an artist, like you get that blank canvas and you get to kind of make what you want to make of it. And the autonomy for sure was one thing that I remember uh, definitely appreciating and being a a self-employed person, a business owner. That's one thing I I can't imagine myself being in the box, like you said, and having to answer to a a greater power, so to speak. So that's pretty cool. We're going to get back to TPOS in just one second, because that's definitely something that's very intriguing. Um, but you spend your time, you split your time between a few different cities, Boston, London, Paris, Italy, some places in Italy, few places in Italy, and you speak multiple different languages. When did this all happen? Like, when did you start traveling between these different cities? What takes you there? When did you learn the languages? Well, what's interesting is I, I moved a lot 
growing up with my family because of my father's studies and his multiple degrees. So we just happened to move a lot. So for me, I, I always thrived on change and new things and meeting new people. Um, so I just always made it a part of my personal culture, I guess you could say. And because we were always changing and when I'd go into new schools, I would also meet the other children who had moved a lot. And typically they were from other countries. So I was fascinated by their languages and their cultures. So from a very young age, very young, I, I literally just started picking up other languages. So I, um, I speak a few. Mm. And I'm always learning more. And also, even with the TFOS side, because we work with doctors all over the world, it's incredible because when travel is a little bit easier than it is at the moment, um, I have the opportunity to go to a lot of different places. And I really do make a point of trying to learn as much as the language as I can before I have meetings, even just as an icebreaker. But I've always, I've always loved it. So I started... Um, I actually graduated from university early and moved to Paris because why not? I went to study for a little bit longer. So I, I, I literally, I'm an overachieving geek, I guess. But yes, yeah, so I graduated early and I moved to Paris and it kind of started from there. So, um, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Then, uh, I'm watching you now on social media and navigating all these different things that you're doing. You're truly an entrepreneur, you're a CEO, what, what would you say are some important qualities? What makes a successful entrepreneur in your eyes? Well, first of all, you, I think it's really important to believe in yourself and to have ideas that you believe in. So you have to, I guess you have to be very structured. It's kind of Interesting, I say structure because I just said that I don't fit into a box and I don't like structure. But at the same time, I've had a virtual office since 2000. So I thrive on virtual structure, if that's if that makes any sense. So for being an entrepreneur or CEO, it's really important to be able to direct yourself, maintain yourself, have a vision and follow through and also surround yourself by people who can help you because one, you can't be an expert at everything. Even if you try, you won't be. Even when we started TFOS, I asked my father, would you like me to take some classes so I can learn more about the anatomy of the eye or eye diseases or something? He said, Amy, you know so many of the world's experts in ocular surface disease. I can introduce you to people. We know people. We know people who know people. Mm -hmm. He said, focus on what you know and do what you know and just so for me it's always about the team so it's really important as an entrepreneur and a ceo is to build teams that can really support you and really help you achieve your idea or at least get you going in the the right direction because again as one person you cannot do everything even though you try because yes i am definitely an overachieving perfectionist which is not a good thing at, at all and but I have a box of Superman band-aids or should I say Wonder Woman band-aids in my back pocket. So I'm like, I'm going to fall flat. I'm going to scrape my knees, but you know, just get up and just make it happen. And so it's really, I think it's really, really important to believe in yourself and to be able to bring people together that support your passion or your energy and can really add to, add to your vision and, and help you, help you, help you see your path. Right. That what would you say to, I like that Wonder Woman Band-Aid thing. That's, that's good. Um, what do you say to the solopreneur then, the person who's really kind of bootstrapping, starting from, yeah. And then, well, I mean, in the sense that they don't have the funding or funds to create or build a team to pay people. What do you, how do you start there? You just do it. So even with, I mean, I have lots of examples of that and I'm even, I'm doing that now, but say with TFOS, I didn't really have a salary at the beginning. It's like, okay, if you can raise a salary, fantastic. You can get a salary. Um, but it's, again, it's important to find people who believe in what you're doing and find, say, incentivize them in other ways, because if it's your company, you work for free, 
not 24 seven, it's 28 mm. seven. So, but you can't expect others to work for free because it's not their dream. It's not their vision. So what can you do to engage them and make them as passionate or at least energized so you can bring them along the path with you and then say, I will give you this. I will help you do that. And it's really, again, it's really a team effort. So it's bootstrapping. It's part of it. It's, it's, basically the grassroots effort I used to do, say canvassing for politics once upon a time, but you know, it's like knock on the door, hi, you can't do these things anymore, but knock on the door, hi, would you like to learn more about this candidate? Let me give you some information. And it's, it's really the same thing, whether you're going out to investors or you're doing sales or what have you, because people don't know who you are. People don't know why they should support you. People don't, it, people just don't trust anybody else. So it's like, how do you, how do you bring, how do you bootstrap? How do you get to the start from the beginning, build the foundation and bring the team together? So it's, there really isn't an exact recipe, but I think positive energy helps. And yeah. Definitely people are drawn to uh, energy, whether it's positive or whether it's some other kind of vibration that, that kind of gets them like feeling this is worthwhile Coffee. being part of. Pardon me? Lots of coffee. Lots yeah. of coffee, especially this time in the morning. Um, what would you say regarding, you know, we don't have to go too deep into this, but uh, ra raising um, capital, like fundraising, that type of thing, or getting people to invest, is that something that you've spent a lot of time doing? And any real quick tips for somebody who might want to start doing that? I I've been doing that my entire life, okay. and it's not easy. There's actually someone um, from the TFOS world that literally from industry called me a pit bull <laughs> and he told me, and this is from a big, big company. And he told me, Amy, you are a pit bull. You walk into a room and people just whip out their checkbooks. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I mean, I guess, and my screen name Ninja, I just, I guess I just, I go in for the kill and I have, <laughs> I have backup information and I won't back down until I get, you know, get what I'm asking for. And that, I mean, that's really a tip. If you believe in what you're doing, if you believe in what you're creating and you can back it up with evidence and you can back it up with as much as like all of your I can't, blood, sweat and tears, really. Um, if you can get someone to believe in that, you can typically raise the funds. But I will say it is TFOS is very different because TFOS is a nonprofit or the, the foundation I have with the Vatican Museums. Those are nonprofits. So it's very different asking for a donation for a nonprofit than it is raising capital for a new venture. So with Eyes the Story, it's a whole other game. It's really, um, and it's not easy. And I, I, don't, I don't like to put it into this context, but truthfully, being female, it's very, very, very challenging raising capital for the company. Um, and again, I don't want to turn it into that type of conversation, but I've had a lot of investors tell me, well, you know, that's a cute idea, but you know, where's your private life? How are you going to balance that? You know, are you really dedicated to this new company? Because you kind of work a lot. And, and I just look at that and say, I'm not asking you to find me a date. I'm asking you to fund my company and the private life has nothing to do with it. So it's actually really interesting in terms of fundraising because. You know, that's Amy, that's something you, I, we, it wasn't a planned part of our conversation, but if you're okay with it, I'm interested to go a little bit further into that because um, personally, I, when I see somebody who is, um, successful or ambitious um gendering and race and stuff like that actually kind of just gets completely blurred to me I, I i get intimidated just as equally from men and women i get you know motivated by men and women equally so uh, i find it really interesting and unfortunate that that still happens but what would you say to other women then who are in that position like what would you what have you done to overcome that that, that serious down. like hurdle yeah. don't back down and it's just, um, you really, I think you, I don't like to say you have to fight, but you have to really prove yourself because it isn't just a numbers game. It's who you are as a person and what you've achieved elsewhere, because maybe, you know, 
I, I started out working in the international banking space. So I, I literally started working with very powerful international businessmen. So I was sort of groomed in that area and I knew how to maneuver that. Um, and it's interesting fundraising now because again, I'm faced with the same men that I worked with at the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at me now as though they were looking at me when I first started my career. And they said, well, who do you think you are? You're a little kid. What, why should we write you a check for a million dollars? And I look at them and just say, you just spent a million dollars on the golf course last, yesterday because you just lost a bet. A million dollars is nothing. It's just, I mean, I can't even, when I'm going for, say, the $10 million raise, I'm not really sure. Well, I know what I'll have to do for that. But it's just really interesting because it's it's cultural as well. Um, and there are women's groups out there that do fund female founded startups um, and small businesses, but they typically don't all either fall into my category. So what's really interesting is that when you have a concept that's addressing an unmet need that has not been done before, you can't say, well, they did it this way, I'm doing it better, or they did it that way, and this is how I would change it. Instead, you say, I have this new idea, and I want you to be a part of the story. So please write me a check. And they'll look at it and say, I don't understand. So how do you how do you ask a male to invest money into, a, say, a beauty and wellness play? Because it sounds sort of like, oh, how sweet. Why don't you just have a bake sale? Mm -hmm. It's seriously, it's interesting because, you know, if you have an ophthalmic diagnostic, it's evident because you're like, oh, okay, so let's collect a tear sample kind of thing. But if it's an eyeliner, Mm. who what like that but the fact that you bring them together and you're like oh you understand the pharma space you understand say the diagnostic space you understand but then it's a beauty thing it doesn't i don't know sorry i kind of digress there but no. it's it's really it's an interesting play because again it's not a golf game and um it's like, you know, how do you how do you prove yourself because it's just different because it's not something that men or women get Women yeah. think you're supposed to have a bake sale. Men think you're supposed to have a bake sale. So you're just sitting there going, yeah, I do that too. But yeah. that's it's weird that it's, uh, it, you know, often when we look at gender bias, we look at it as men looking at women a certain way. But actually women look at women and often women are worse. it's women just are as worse. bad. And it, that's even more unfortunate <laughs> to me. But that reminds me of um, the story of um, you know, the, the brand Spanx. Mm -hmm. um, What's her name? Sarah Blakely, maybe Sarah your founder. Blakely. You know, it sounds like a lot of what you're describing is what she was descri has described in her kind of um, the story of, of starting that brand. And like people were just kind of like, "Oh, that's cute. Like, I'll see you later." And then yeah, eventually, it's you got, cute. eventually, you gotta. I guess you just gotta stick with it to get in that one person convinced, and then kind of roll with that. Um, thank you, thank you for those insights because it, it it's one thing to like hear somebody kind of give like kind of that polished answer that they've practiced in some other interview, somebody like Sarah Blakely, for example, who's done a million interviews specifically talking about that story, but I actually prefer most answers are not so clear cut black and white. A lot of them are like this kind of like, you have to be like, ah, oh, it's this or this. Because I'm still fundraising. So when I get to, when I get to that level, I will say, okay, Harbier, we're going to have another interview and I'm going to tell you how I did it. But Perfect. you know, right now it's like there really there isn't a recipe yeah there isn't a recipe other than believe in yourself and don't back down so you have to sometimes you just have to be a pit bull maybe that's awesome you pit bull, maybe you yeah. can teach me how to be a pit bull <laughs> i need that i need those lessons okay so um we've already mentioned it many many times but uh the tear film and ocular surface society so originally founded by your father and co-created by yourself as you said you joined um early 2000s to kind of bring it to fruition. Can you tell me what your dad does and oh, how yeah. he started it? Oh yeah, so, well, Dr. David Sullivan. So my father is at Scape and Research Institute and he is, you know, a lot of people know him as the dry eye guy. So oh, okay. he specializes, he's a PhD, specializes in, specializing in ophthalmology, endocrinology, and immunology, yeah. um, otherwise known as the menage a trois. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but that, that's a different presentation. Yeah, so no basically, so when he was a graduate student at Dartmouth Medical School, he had, I'll just make the long story short without giving a whole TFOS presentation, but he decided one day he wanted to bring together his international peers and colleagues, basically, and sort of replicate a meeting that his supervisor at that time was doing in Bermuda. So that's how he started it. In 1992, he organized a conference in Bermuda for, or I think there were about 120 doctors from around the world that came and the meeting started. I think they started probably around six o'clock in the morning and went until around 10 o'clock at night because once again, oh. overachieving geek, it runs in the family. Um, it was in Bermuda. They never, they never saw the beach. They didn't know where they were. They just knew they had a lot of work to do. Um, and then he did another one in uh, 1996. And mind you, he has a laboratory. So he, he doesn't have a conference management company. This was his idea. He indexed everything. This is when fax machines still happen. I think fax machines maybe were invented then. He was doing everything literally handwritten. Um, and then in 2000, he incorporated the name Tearfilm Inocular Surface Society because he realized well, not just realized, but organizing a conference is extraordinarily expensive. And he said, mm -hmm. okay, my great, 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 great grandchildren could be paying for this conference if it doesn't go well. So how am I going to do this? So that was one of the reasons why he decided to at least incorporate the name Tearful Monocular Surface Society. So then in um, November of 2000, when he organized that meeting, so I mean, the name he ordered organized these international conferences, but there wasn't an actual name for name at all until he incorporated it um, in 2000. And then in that conference, everybody that attended was surveyed and asked, would you like to participate in a more formal organization? So it isn't just a conference every four years, but we could get together on maybe on a more regular basis, but at least do something more than just every four years show up. So that was in November of 2000. And then in 2001, again, 9-11 happened. And I think it was um, November of 2001, my father asked me if I'd be willing to help him actually create the society because he said, well, everybody wants it. I don't have time. <laughs> I have a laboratory. Your background is in business and blah, blah, blah. Um, could you help me create this? So we kicked off TFOS as it's known today in January of 2002. Um, but there were many, many, many years of pre plotting, mm -hmm. um, by my father. So yeah. then we created it into a beast. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, so yeah, no kidding. It's, it's a beast. I mean, Anybody who is in any, even like me, who's just sort of like getting into the dry eye space, not like so heavily in it, like some other colleagues of mine, but pretty much anybody who's even trying to get into the dry eye needs to know TFOS and dues too. Like it, it's just like the Bible now, basically, right? It, it, it's, you can't talk about dry eye without referencing dues too. It's what people use to reference, to diagnose, to treat. Like it's most of the recommendations are coming from there. And that is incredible. In a nutshell, if you could tell me, how do you put something like that crazy together? Who do you have to bring into a crazy room? Crazy is a good word. Crazy is a really good word. Um, so the first one was the TFOS Dues Report that was published in 2007. And the European Medicines Agency, in fact, did call it the Bible for dry eye. So yeah, well, for I'm 10 not years, <laughs> industry was sharing it with their employees saying, okay, if you're an ocular surface, anything, you have to read this Bible. Um, so in 2017, we published TFOS Dues 2, the sequel, <laughs> and I say crazy is the perfect word for it because truthfully, the whole, the whole venture was literally a multi-year production. It, it took almost three years to put the whole thing together. It took more than $2 million to fund the whole thing. There were more than 150 specialists from around the world that participated, so many different subcommittees, so many different, I mean, just, I think the subcommittee that the sex gender hormone subcommittee that my father was part of probably had over a thousand pages of their initial, but probably just references for that. But let's just say the 424 page report was 
less than half of a DNA sample of what it started out to be. So it was literally, it was an insane undertaking because again, we had experts from around the world and it was really not only re redefining dry eye disease and reestablishing the importance of the fact that it's a disease um, and it's quite omnipresent, but also realizing that there's so much more work to be done because between 2007 and 2017, the 10 year window, <clears throat> the number of publications and the number of clinical trials that were created because of this new education that was, was created and disseminated absolutely phenomenal. But then we realized, oh my goodness, there's so much more that we don't know and so much more that we need to do. So it's really, it's absolutely exciting and daunting simultaneously yeah. because it's like, wow, there are specialists that focus just on dry eye now. And TFOS itself isn't just dry eye, it's ocular surface disease. And I mean, for example, our next workshop will in fact be on well, I like to call it the lifestyle epidemic because in fact, ocular surface disease is something in many cases that we bring on ourselves. Mm -hmm. It isn't just iatrogenic dry eye, but there are so many of our lifestyle choices that we do, that we make that are inadvertent in some cases that can compromise our vision and cause or exacerbate OSD. So um, yeah, that's our next workshop. That's incredible. And what's the timeline on that? If that, if you're allowed to say first fundraising first. Okay. <laughs> so I look, I look at it and say, okay, well, TFOS dues to cost us over $2 million to produce um, and disseminate and do all that fun stuff. So obviously, um, well, not obviously, but we will try to make this workshop a little bit of a smaller production. <laughs> Instead of having 150 experts, we'll kind of like <laughs> bring it down a little bit because that's also, it's not, it's not easy to have that many people involved in something. Mm -hmm. Um, so hopefully we will start that soon. I'll be obviously starting fundraising for that soon. Um, and then we'll have, we'll have more information available very sure. soon tierfilm.org sign up <laughs> tierfilm.org mm -hmm. okay yeah that i mean i guess with dues the first uh, workshop and now then dues two you've laid such a huge foundation that maybe you don't have to tackle so many things all at once now you can kind of maybe focus on more specific oh, like, you'd be lifestyle oh yeah no. well i mean i mean Even you know one of the other things that i know is like the more you learn the more you realize you don't know right so then you start to dig into all this other stuff so well, even it, to that point, even with the iatrogenic section of the of TFOS dues too, everybody realized, wow, there's so much more that we need to address. So then we thought about having the next workshop be iatrogenic dry eye. And then we said, stop, wait, no, <laughs> it's not just iatrogenic. In fact, okay, there is obviously doctor induced dry eye disease, but and again, so many cases, it's patient induced. So mm -hmm. it's, again, what are we doing to ourselves that will cause or exacerbate oc ocular surface disease? So it's, it's, it's growing into another beast because we realize there's so much more to it. It isn't just one, two, three, four, five. There are a lot of subcommittees at this point. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you just had the 2020 conference, the TFOS 2020 conference. And from the sounds of it, it was a huge success, even given all the circumstances. Um, so as a virtual presentation, it sounds like it went really well. Can you just tell us how, how it went down and what went down during that conference? So the TFOS 2020, again, it was so heartbreaking not to be able to gather everyone together in Northern Italy. By Lake Como. That was, uh, we yeah, had that so is sad, unfortunately. phenomenal things. I would love to go to Lake Como. <laughs> I know. I'm like, can I just have a party there so if we could at least have something to give everybody an excuse to come? Because, yeah. wow, it was really a very special location. Um, and again, I didn't, I didn't want to give that up. And I said, everyone was so excited to come and we had spent more than three years planning that meeting. Mm -hmm. So what we had also done was plan a pre-meeting to the meeting. And that session it was going to be a half day session about addressing the unmet needs of ocular <laughs> addressing the unmet needs of ocular surface disease around the world because last year in Rome we brought together the European ambassadors who gave presentations about the unmet needs in their respective countries so we thought okay it would be fantastic if we bring the, the several experts from around the world to address 
the unmet needs globally, because this will also be a good teaser for what we are doing with our global ambassador program. So I said, okay, we can't have the conference. We can't have the party, of course. Um, but we have to do something because we just want to keep the excitement going. We want the passion to keep going and we want people to realize that there's so much more that needs to be done. So that's how we ended up creating the, it was about a five hour presentation last week um, in Rome. And it was just, it was really, it, again, it was heartbreaking because we couldn't have everyone together in Northern Italy, but it was also tremendous to be able to have some of the, the KOLs come to Rome, in fact, because there were there were several of them that actually were able to come, mm -hmm. fly there, and be present. So we were able to do a live stream as well. So we had um, the TV crew on site in Rome. So the doctors that were in Rome were present, um, not breathing on each other. <laughs> and then we had live stream all over the world. Um, it was really, it was really, really, it was exciting. It was nerve wracking, but it was exciting. Yeah. And so it's- And it was, and how many people, how many people attended virtually? Well, we had uh, about 2000 registrations, but we've also made the presentations available online for viewing afterwards. So we've had over 4,500 hits now. So. Wow. And we're asking people to share it because, again, the presentations are about the unmet needs of ocular surface disease around the world. And people can watch the presentations one by one. They don't have to watch the whole session because, again, it was about five hours in total. But it's really fantastic because you can go in for free. You just sign up and you can watch all of it and just get a snapshot of all the different areas that – really are necessary to address it's it's really good for the industry because they can see potentially how to address their products or some new product ideas what have you but it's really great for your colleagues too because you can see what others what others need mm -hmm. in other parts of the world and it may give you some ideas or, or new treatment or diagnostic suggestions or mm -hmm. There is a lot of opportunity that's generated from that, but it's just, it's really, really important to keep sharing because it engages everyone. And even though we can't be together in person, it's just, I mean, TFOS has always been virtual in fact, because we, when we launched, we had, I don't know, we probably had about 40 different countries involved when we first launched, but now we have doctors and scientists and in over 100 countries That's so true. we can't get wow. together on a regular basis so it's all virtual mm -hmm. and when we can be in person it it definitely helps but we can still do a lot just you know talking well that's i guess what minor silver lining of COVID is it's sort of advanced this whole virtual experience a little bit it's forced everyone to get into it a bit more and that might help people connect a little bit better, you know, who, who are all these, diff all these different countries. So where can people check out those videos and, and share them? Airfilm.org. So on the homepage, okay. the front smack center, you can just <laughs> click on it, register, and you can access everything. It doesn't Perfect. cost anything all free and all anybody free. can share i mean everything's in english usually i mean when we do tfos meetings they're all in english when we do reports we translate them into different languages but um but everything's free you can share please share that's awesome. um, okay well that that's amazing but the the really the big thing i wanted to focus on in this conversation is this amazing brand that you've just launched oh hey I, I thought that was a pen that, that you're holding for a bit there. I was like, okay, no, it's actually, it's Strategic actually much more valuable thing. than that. Yes. It, yeah. So eyes are the story. This wellness meets beauty, blurring the lines between, tell me again, pharma and beauty and pharma. Beauty and pharma. pharma and beauty. Like, yeah. wow. How, I, I have so many questions, but like, just give me your breakdown of eyes are the story, um, what it is and, and who it's intended for. So as for the story, first of all, even the name, it has a story behind it because what is the entire focus of this new brand? The eyes, because that's why I created it. And in fact, when I first started with the whole TFOS movement, again, I needed to educate myself about the ocular surface and eye health, and I needed to be able to process as much information into my brain and translate it into my I like to say human speak. Mm -hmm. So I started asking a lot of questions and then I was thinking maybe there is a larger prevalence of 
dry eye, for example, in women because of eye makeup. Mm. Is that possible? So I started researching the different chemicals in eye makeup and skincare, and I realized, wow, <laughs> there's a lot more to learn. Um, so that was, that's kind of how it started. And now I lost your question. Oh, like, no, that's, that's good. That's how it started. That, yeah, that's the question, it, started. it wasn't a very yeah. specific question. It was just like, how? Because you know what? I think yeah. about this. Amy and I, I look at like, okay, so I've been fortunate to be involved in a few different little ventures, kind of startup related type of things. But I look at this and I'm like, man, there's so much to know. I wouldn't even know where to start. So like, for example, how do you know which labs to work with and which manufacturers to work with? What was the process of figuring that out? Well, that was not easy either. So when I first thought about doing this, I said, okay, how how do I do it? Because obviously I'm not going to knock on the door of a big beauty brand and say, hi, I have this idea. Do you want to, you want to work mm. together? Cause whoo -whoo, they just steal it and run with yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't work like that. So I actually, because of all my years working with TFOS, I have a lot of relationships in the ophthalmic pharmaceutical space. So I started asking around, you know, do you know any laboratories, blah, blah, blah. So there was one laboratory that I wanted to work with that I said, oh, well, we could create this whole product line, everything. And they told me, yes, this sounds wonderful. But then dun, 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 they said it would take at least two years to get authorization just to start doing some, say, dabbling in the laboratory because they have, you know, their protocols in a laboratory. You can't just whip up a new chocolate cake because if you've always been making vanilla, you can't do chocolate so it doesn't work like that i don't want to go into the science <laughs> so but basically they couldn't do it without the authorizations so they said we can't or we can but we need to file for the authorizations first and i said oh mm -hmm. um okay let me get back to you on that one so then i started um i literally started cold calling private label companies because then i said okay well how do I do this if I can't go to a laboratory and ask them to make products for me? Let's do private label. But I realized with private label, after calling so many companies, I lost count. They're really, I don't want to say there isn't quality control, but you can't control what's in the bottle. Basically, you can call them up and say, oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. You pay them, you slap your new logo on it, boom, and you put it on a shelf. And I said, no. That's not what I want because the whole point is I don't like the chemicals that I'm finding in the products. I need to be able to create my own. Once again, creating a monster. So I went through my network, went through my network, went through my network. And um, one of my contacts has had a contact with a laboratory in Canada um, who only works with big name cosmetic brands. Mm. And they said, we do not look at startups, so we don't care. But your idea sounds interesting because, mm -hmm. and, and so the whole sensitive eyes, dry disease, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you mean that the chemicals can actually impact this? Well, somebody in the business development department actually had dry eye. So they said, wait, 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 we want to hear more information. Mm -hmm. So... I started, I started with them in terms of the formulation and it's really amazing because then they introduced me to another laboratory and then I ended up working with a, another laboratory. So I do, I am collaborating with one um, ophthalmic pharmaceutical company um, and those products will be, you know, known later, but basically, so they're helping me with some things. Then I have a laboratory in Canada that at this point they do the mascara and eyeliner. Then I have a, um, a laboratory that I'm collaborating with in the U S and they're the ones that do the, um, face wash, the cleanser and the, the serum. So, so different laboratories yeah. for different products. Exactly. So it's not, it's not easy because unless you're a multi-billionaire that can just set up shop and say, Oh, I have my own laboratory. You can't do it because yeah. again, as I said at the beginning, you might want to be a specialist for everything, but you can't. And it's the same with laboratories because if one laboratory is authorized to do one thing, they can't do the other. Mm -hmm. So that's an know. amazing, perfect, like example of perseverance when you have like kind of what you touched on before, when you have a vision and you believe in it and you stick with it, um, you know, but like on a 
on a much grander scale than I would like normally be talking to young optometrists or optometry students about. But, um, you know, I, I often will tell people like it sounds old school and it sounds um, like not technologically advanced enough. But I'll tell people like you literally just pick up the phone and start calling people literally because you might have to call 10 people. But like somebody's going to be like, oh, you know what? I like your you taking this initiative. Let me see if I can put you in touch with someone else. And from there, another door opens and then another door opens, but it didn't happen until like somebody might think, well, Amy got lucky and she had somebody who knew somebody, but you had to call how many people before you connected with that somebody, person? I'm like, pound the door, pound the door, pound the door. I'm like, so, okay, there must be someone. And I mean, it took years. It, it literally, it wasn't something that I just did overnight either. I, I started in 2015, um, actually... I mean, I had been thinking about it for a really long time because I started doing the research about all of this back in 2002, actually, um, when I had the idea. But it wasn't until 2015 that I said, oh, maybe I should just try to do it. And that's yeah. actually, I had mentioned it to Leslie O'Dell. I said, I think I really need to just try. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, I'm not sure what I'm getting myself into, um, but. That's like, amazing. So I wanted to ask you, like, from inception to launch, what was that? So officially, you kind of like made the decision 2015, you're going to do it. And then, so five years, would you say roughly, from when you decided yeah, well, I'm going to do it? Because it took, it took a good two, so that would say around, let's say I incorporated the name at the beginning of 2016. So, so that's when I started, I think 2016, I really, that's when I started speaking with all the, all the different companies and the, the laboratories and just started. So I really, I didn't actually start doing formulations. I, I don't know. Let's see. Formulations, maybe 2017. So I did about two years of pre-work mm -hmm. and I self-funded everything wow. um until i didn't start asking anyone for money until last year because again it goes back to the story of well aren't you cute you know mm -hmm. it's just like oh are you baking cookies in your kitchen um no <laughs> so um yeah no it was it was several years of pre-work before I even had any product yeah. so or even had the laboratory relationships that I could move forward with so there was lots and lots of due diligence lots of lots lots and lots of legal work um, I have so many attorneys it's ridiculous uh, for for everything um, and yeah it's a, a lot of due diligence Crazy. So. incredible that you're able to manage and handle all of that. Um, and again, on top of all of that, you choose, well, you didn't choose to, you end up launching amid a pandemic, like another like global crisis, uh, like your previous launches and, and endeavors. Um, so Eyes of the Story launched March this year? It or? was supposed to launch during Vision Expo at the oh, end right. of March in New York. But, Which would have been um, perfect. So tell me so how it what did, in May. What was the, it launched in May. So what was the new approach? You took a month or so to kind of recalibrate and then what did you do? Well, you know, it was tricky because again, it took so long to actually have product or even have the company or anything like that. And even the, the final branding and everything, it was just like, okay, let's launch, let's launch. Cause I had wanted to launch in 2019, but then I said, no, I can't launch in 2019. I have to launch in 2020 because it's a year of vision. <laughs> right. This will help my investor story. I'm doing everything in a year of vision because eyes are the story. Hmm. So, um, <laughs> basically, uh, it was it was really interesting because we said, okay, we can't launch in New York, we can't launch a Vision Expo. When are we going to launch? Because also, well, as we all remember, in March that was basically in North America when the the lockdown happened. Boom! All the clinics closed. Uh oh, because we were supposed to launch through the clinics. So I said, how am I going to launch if we can't even, if the clinics aren't even open? We don't even know, we don't know anything. So John Gellies actually suggested, he said, why don't we come up with a way that 
you know, to excite the the doctors about this brand. And, you know, maybe we can find a way that they can get some sort of return on it because if they can't sell in the clinic, you know, maybe they can do something. Is there any way that we can, I said, wait, 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 wait. So I basically, I set up a way that the, the doctors can, well, they can sell in their clinic, of course, but if they, if, in that case, the clinics weren't open. So we created an affiliate program so doctors could continue the conversation with their patients. They could still have an online presence. They could still learn about the product, blah, blah, blah. People could buy online mm. and then the doctors could actually get a cut because, I mean, why not? It's, yeah. it's easy. And so that's how we did it because so many of the doctors were at home. Their clinics are closed. They're on the sofa doing so many Zoom calls. They're, mm -hmm. you know, going, oh my God, where are my patients? Oh my God, where am I? <laughs> What's <laughs> going on? When is the world coming back to normal? And what? And then also, even with the Zoom calls, which is fantastic and creepy and just bizarre, <laughs> but because everybody was in front of a screen now, everybody was thinking about eye makeup. So True. what better excuse to say, hey, let's, let's talk about eye makeup makeup and beauty and I mean it was well, so amusing at the even beginning. Even more now we're all wearing masks so I'm actually finding I maybe I'm I asked my wife about this I was like do you think that women are doing their eye makeup a little bit more than they used to because she's like yeah pretty sure so um it, like I feel like it's even more relevant thanks to the masks um you know yep. thanks to zoom uh so well, Scott Schachter made up a word <laughs> Um, I think it, oh, it was before our, our TFOS briefing in DC for dry awareness a month. He said, think about it. Mask era, like masker, mascara, mascara yeah, as in the eyelash thing, but mascara, meaning overly makeup while wearing a mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's true. very true. That's good. That's so, what we go to him for smart things like that. Um, yeah. so with all of that, with the new approach, how, how are things going uh, now doctors are back in the office? Are they starting to carry this product in the office as well? Yes. Well, it's interesting because, again, it's such a sensitive time because I don't want to push people and say, buy product, sell product, boom, 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 because you know, there are still people getting sick. There's still a bizarre pandemic above our heads. So mm. People are opening their clinics, but in many cases, you know, they're not, they're not restocking supplies that they normally would. They're not ordering new supplies. They're not doing it. They're just trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. Mm -hmm. So it's different in that sense because I, I even lowered the minimums for wholesale. So before it was like, okay, you know, Every clinic will order 100 boxes, no big deal, that's easy. You know, I actually, with Brigitte Chen Lee, we went over all of the pricing because she has a lot of traffic in her clinic and she stocks a lot. She's like, okay, these are these are the prices, this is good, this is, you know, it's this, this will, this will be great. Pandemic hits, clinics close, we're like, no product, so how do you do that? So now the clinics are reopening and people are starting to get back into the swing of things, but it's still, so it's just, it's, it's slow. So mm -hmm. the, the doctors are definitely, they're signing up. We have a lot of, we have, I don't know, we have it. We probably have at least a hundred wholesale accounts set up and a hundred affiliate links like um, accounts set up and it's mm -hmm. great, but it's still, everybody is really hesitant because they're like, I, I'm so afraid. <laughs> it's like, what? But then they think, oh, wait, my patients are all using extra eye makeup now. And this is a great conversation to have. So, I mean, it's really, I've had, there are a couple of doctors that are, have already done about five orders. Oh, wow. So it's really, it's starting to yeah. get more of a, a normal rhythm. Um, so it, it's just, it's great because there's the option to buy from the clinic or you can get online. And what's also cool with the affiliate link, you can actually embed it into your clinic oh. link, uh, your clinic page. So if you have your own clinic, you can have, um, a page uh, and there are actually several of your colleagues who have done that so they'll have a section on say beauty and wellness whatever and they'll do eyes with a story and then they put in their affiliate link so then they can sell it at the clinic but they can also sell it online and then if they sell it online they don't actually have to ship it and that's also and then one of your Canadian colleagues Claudine Curie she has her online site so she has the products in her with her 
in Montreal, but the it's easier for people to buy from her site and she'll ship in Canada instead of having to buy in the US and then blah, 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 deal with for all sure. the the duties and all that so it's really it's interesting to see how people are integrating it onto their websites or into their clinic so again it's it's really a rhythm but it's disruptive it's different because it's not something it's it's not an area that people were doing before so yeah, it's for sure so yeah it's it's different and i think going back to kind of what you're saying about like the looking for funding and stuff it's hard to bring that up with like here I'm doing something that hasn't been done for, before please trust me I can I can make this work and then you know the pandemic and everything but sounds like um, things are finally starting to come together and that that's really great which uh, can you give me a quick breakdown of the the lineup of products that you have now um, and then how somebody can bring Absolutely. them into their practice so first of all everything can be found out via eyes the story.com very easy eyes the story and um, what we have, you can order, in order to access the wholesale prices, you have to set up a wholesale account and that can be done info at eyesorthestory.com. So again, very simple. Mm -hmm. So what we have for the first generation is we have, a, it's, a, it's a small collection and we did that intentionally because we want to focus the story on eye health. So we have the basics that you'll use in the morning before you go to the office, for example, or the clinic, or what you do at night before you go to bed. So we have a, a face wash. We have the, without going into all the reasons why, but everything was developed because everything you use on or around your eyes can impact your vision. So the face wash actually is relevant because of the ingredients in the face wash does not hurt the eyes. So, so we have a face wash. It's a month supply of face wash. We, there's a, a bottle of serum, which can be used around the eyes or on the entire face. And I've also had people t say that if they have flaky lids, they love using another because the flakiness goes away. Okay. So it's, a, it's called an eye proof serum, eye proof facial serum. So you can use it on your face and around the eyes. Um, and I would not recommend the serum. Um, only doctors can tell their patients, yes, you can use it on your lids, but I did not tell people, oh yeah, you can use it on flaky lids because somebody, somebody actually said, oh, this is so good. Can I use it to, you know, lubricate my eyes? I said, no. <laughs> um, so yes. So face wash, serum, then we have an eyelid wipe, eyelid towelette, which can be used to um, refresh the lids or cleanse the lids because obviously hygiene is so important, but it, they're also good for removing the eyes or the story eye makeup, which we have. Um, it, we have mascara and eyeliner. So we currently have black eyeliner and black mascara, but we're soon to be offering as well um, dark brown or espresso. Espresso, I love that. The so, um, the branding before sorry uh, before we move on is something that I absolutely love. I love talking about branding, personal branding, and then branding for companies and, and and products and things. And like like you look at it, and man, like I I want to buy it just because of like it just looks so good. How did you come well, up that, with that, or like what was the process? That was part of that as well. Because all right, think about going into. I don't want to call it other brands, but say Apple store. Somebody goes in an Apple store. They're just so excited to get a box from Apple. Mm. They're like, Ooh, pretty. I'm going to go home and, you know, play with my new toy or La Perla with lingerie. It's just such beautiful wrapping. And you're like, wow, this is just, so we wanted to do something. So we actually made two doctor sets. So we made box sets for the clinics. So every individual um, item has its own box with the, say the eye chart, Snellen chart on the front facade. And on the inside, you'll actually have a, um, an iris mm -hmm. but what's neat is in the box collection you have it's you open it up and you're like wow you, you the iris is just really 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 cool it's very obvious but for someone who's not a doctor it's not icky yeah <laughs> so okay that's a good that's a good point it, but it, and it's also not feminine so it's um it's it's everyone because everybody has eyes, everybody has sensitive eyes. And so the idea is really to have something that you want to get excited about and you can use it again. The collection box is really neat because mm -hmm. you could put pens in it. You can put your contact lens assortment. I don't know what it like. There's so many cufflinks. You can put everything in there because it's this great little box. And, yeah. and so the design was really, really important because we wanted people to feel like, again, when you go to a doctor's office, 
you think, okay, my eyes are bothering me. You leave your doctor's office, you feel old, ugly, and sick. Mm. You don't want that. But if you can buy something really pretty and sexy and cool and sort of like a Bond toy, you know, it's like everybody wants to be Bond um, or Ninja. Um, It just, it doesn't make you feel old and ugly. And you think, okay, well, maybe if I listen to my eye doctor, my eyes might not be so bad and maybe I won't feel sick. And I can address the situation, but I should trust my eye doctor because they sell me really amazing things and they make me feel better. So it's really, you know, it's kind of like putting hope in a bottle as well because you actually feel good about it and you want to try it and you want to, you don't want to leave the doctor's office feeling old, ugly, and sick. So that was the mentality as well. We didn't want it to look like a pharmaceutical product. Right. No, it looks, it looks beautiful. Honestly, the packaging is very attractive. And I, I kind of guess, I guess I get like a little more excited about that stuff maybe than the average person. So looking at like just the lines of the shape of the bottle and the branding of it all is just fantastic. Good job. So um, with every podcast that I do, there's always two questions that I like to ask every guest at the end of the podcast. And so I'd like to ask you those now. The first one is if we could hop in a time machine and go back to any specific point in your life where you were struggling You can share that moment if you'd like, but more importantly, what advice would you give to yourself in that particular moment? Once again, it goes back into the entrepreneur person persona. Um, Really it's, you have to believe in yourself and it is absolutely, it's not easy to deal with stress. It's not easy to deal with change. It's not easy to deal with obstacles, but as I said at the beginning, if there's an obstacle in your way, move it. <laughs> just just find a way. So no, it's not easy. Launching a company during a pandemic is not easy. And it takes all of you to believe that you can do it. Launching a company without investors <laughs> is not easy. But you say, I created this company for a reason because there is an unmet need. I have to do it. There are so many times that you can give up. There are so many times that you can just curl up on your sofa and just put the eye patches on and go, no, you can't. You just have to get up and say, go. And um, that's That's fantastic. I think that's, as an entrepreneur, that's extremely relevant, but I feel like that's relevant in so many other areas of life. I mean, whether you're a student or a doctor or in some other realm, being able to struggle or battle through those tough times and, and persevere. Like you have so many times in your career already. It's pretty I mean, amazing. Even say it's just, you know, there's, it's, it can be cheesy to some people, but the, this expression, you know, I opened two gifts this morning, my eyes, you know, that's a blessing in itself. I don't care if it's raining outside or cold, you know, it's raining. The flowers will be happy. They, every day is a new day. Every day we get to open our eyes and see something. It is literally, it is a blessing. And I, back to your art comments earlier, it's just art is such a part of my life and everything that I do in all of my companies. But vision is like art because it's priceless. Hmm. And we really have to, we have to, we, again, we have to focus, but, you know, focus on ourselves, believe in ourselves and move it forward. And if there's an obstacle, just move it that's beautiful vision is like art because it's priceless that's amazing very well said i'd like to end on that but i do have one more question for you so we're going to go through that everything that you've achieved like everything wow all the stuff that you've done um you know really really amazing stuff how much of what you've achieved up until now would you say is due to luck and how much is due to hard work um I happen to be a little bit superstitious. I have my evil eye on me, uh, but I don't think anything is really luck. I mean, it's lucky when I run into someone I haven't seen for a while and that's special, but in terms of business, everything is hard work. Nothing has come easily, nothing. Even though I can make it seem easy sometimes and glamorous, <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing. Nothing has come easy. And that's another thing that my family definitely instilled in me, work hard, and work harder and you know you know hopefully you get to where you want to go but don't give up you can't give up and maybe i thrive on challenges and obstacles and drama it does seem that way trauma too (laughs) trauma or drama 
drama, you know, yeah. maybe trauma too, but trauma can fall into the drama categories. Yeah, yeah. It's just you have a thing for the dramatic. It, it makes a good story. It, that's true. It's and so the hard. eyes are the story. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Amy, yeah. so much. That, honestly, you, what incredible insights, incredible uh, knowledge and, and just such a fun conversation. Where can people find you online? Where, where would you like people to connect with you? Well, let's just keep it easy. Eyesarethestory.com. Come visit, come by, and share the story. Fantastic. Thank awesome. You. And thank you, everybody, who tuned in again for this episode. I know you enjoyed it because Amy is such an amazing guest with so many incredible sh stories and insights to share. Um, if you did like it, please take a screenshot, throw it up on your Instagram story, tag us both, let us know what you thought, what you took away from it. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, hit like, leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. Thanks again, everybody, for joining. And thank you again, Amy, for everything you shared today. Thank you.